Welcome to the Rogers TV Canada Showcase. I'm your host, Mike Vecchio. To start the show, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapiwak peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Today's program will feature stories from coast to coast, from Rogers TV and Shaw Spotlight stations across the country. We'll start along the shores of Lake Erie near Port Stanley, Ontario, where you'll find one of the most renowned observation point for over 20 birds of prey. Let's find out why birders and nature lovers have been visiting Hawkscliff Woods for generations. <laughs> So today we're visiting Hawcliff Woods. It's a spectacular 230 acre nature reserve right on the shoreline of Lake Erie. So Hawcliff has been known for many, many years as a, an excellent site to watch uh, migrating hawks. Uh, so even since the early 1950s, it's been well known as a great birding site. Um, so people have been visiting this area for ages uh, to look at birds, particularly during migration. But it's also a spectacular site for other birds that make their uh, life here in the forest. In uh, 2016, Thames Talbot Land Trust was able to protect this nature reserve permanently so that we can provide habitat for all the wildlife and provide an opportunity for people to visit and get to know the other creatures that live here. Um, once Thames Talbot Land Trust protected the, this nature reserve, we were able to do additional restoration projects to create more habitat. So some of the former agricultural fields have been restored to thriving habitat meadows. We've installed wetlands, and we've also been doing uh, various enhancements within the forest habitat to create a better um, ecosystem for the wildlife that live here. So a few years ago, uh, we were really trying to promote native plant gardening in the community. And one of the most spectacular things that you can do in your own backyard is to create habitat for wildlife. The availability of native plants, however, has not been super abundant. So a lot of people were struggling to find those plants to put in their gardens. So we decided to start a native plant garden here at Hawcliff Woods. So the Ozens Community Wildflower Garden is an opportunity for people to come see these native plants at different life stages and to actually be able to collect seeds from those to take back home to create their own wildlife sanctuary in their backyard. So Hawcliffe Woods is really famous for the ravine system. Um, and because there's lots of ravines, it means trails um, have to really work around those ravines because people can't climb through them necessarily. So we do have two different trail opportunities at Hawcliffe Woods where people can go hiking and see the different habitats. Um, both of them are relatively short, less than a kilometer of a walk, uh, but it's a great experience to be able to go in and see some of the woods uh, firsthand. So Hawcliffe is obviously on a cliff, um, as the name implies. Um, and for the last few years, the cliff has been eroding. So while it's eroding, um, it's actually providing habitat for bank swallows and other uh, animals that use it, but it does mean that the shoreline is moving. So it makes it rather unstable and unsafe uh, for people to visit close to the shoreline, um, but it is actually really great habitat for other species that make use of it. So since very early 1950s or 60s, uh, Hawkcliffe Banders have been putting on a presentation at Hawkcliffe uh, to look at migrating birds. And so one of the really spectacular parts of that is this, the festival that centers around migration in the fall. Um, and the hawk banders are able to bring live birds to present to the public to actually show them how banding works and to actually see some of these spectacular animals up close. Uh, the other major thing is that this is a, also a flyway for monarch butterflies. So during that festival in the fall, we have uh, monarch taggers that are here and they will catch monarchs and they apply tags uh, that they can be traced um, throughout their journey back to Mexico. So it's a really great opportunity to see wildlife up close um, and be able to really experience that migration firsthand. If you've never been to Hawcliffe Woods, uh, this is the year you should check it out. Um, there is lots to see here. There's a variety of different habitats, different landscapes, um, and the wildlife is just spectacular. So if you enjoy nature and you want to check out something in your local community, um, do visit us at Hawcliffe Woods.
Up next, we head to Kitchener, which is the perfect place for those looking to get their daily steps in. The city has created trails that connect foot commuters with nature and popular landmarks. Carla Fitzsimmons explains. Pack a good pair of walking shoes if you're coming for a visit to the city of Kitchener. It's known for its walking trails. The Iron Horse Trail is used by more than 250,000 people every year, connecting to key areas within Kitchener. For those that use this passageway, it connects to the ION light rail transit system, on-road and off-road cycling routes, parks and open spaces. The path takes you to downtown Kitchener. It links Kitchener to the city of Waterloo. The name Iron Horse Trail reflects the industrial heritage of the trail built along the former rail corridor. There are several artifacts of historical interest along the path. The trail also forms part of the Trans-Canada Trail. The trail is a multi-use trail. Asphalt spans the length of it and receives year-round maintenance. Another popular trail is the Walter Bean Trail, running for more than 25 kilometers through Kitchener, linking Kiwanis Park in the north to Dune Valley Golf Course in the south. The Walter Bean Trail is an epic trail adventure. It runs along the Grand River. The trail is named in honor of Walter Bean, a local business and community leader who inspired the vision of creating a continuous pathway along the Grand River and through Waterloo Region. The idea was to allow everyone to enjoy its scenic views. For those who are looking for a different view of the Grand River, there are four public canoe launches along the trail. Kitchener plays host to seven popular trails. For more information on each of these trails and maps, visit the City of Kitchener website for more details. A river runs through. Picturesque, tranquil, words often used to describe the Grand River. The Mohawk also refer to this body of water as Willow River for the many willows in the watershed. It is the largest river that flows solely within Southern Ontario's boundaries. From its source near Wareham, Ontario, it flows south through Grand Valley, along Waterloo Region, Brantford and Cayuga before emptying into the north shore of Lake Erie. One of the most scenic and spectacular features of this river is the falls and gorge in Alora. In Waterloo Region, the river keeps its wilderness feel despite flowing through three cities. It plays host to many summer activities. There are a number of trails along the Grand River offering some of the best cycling and hiking opportunities in the area. Spring, summer, fall, or winter, your adventure awaits. Discover the beauty of the Grand River. Carla Fitzsimmons, Showcase Canada, Kitchener. Levant Park is located at the forks of the Thames River in the heart of downtown London, Ontario. The park started life as Tecumseh Park in 1877. Labatt Park holds the distinction of being the oldest continually operated baseball grounds in the world. In 1994, Labatt Park was designated a historical site by London City Council. The park suffered the first of many floods in 1883, which saw the park's grandstand and seating destroyed. The ballpark would be renovated later that year. The grandstand was rebuilt and the baseball diamond was realigned. The original home plate was in present day center field. The new location of home plate was moved to where center field was in the original diamond layout. The home plate would now face east towards downtown London. In 1937, the park again suffered a major flood. Labatt Brewing Company, which at that point owned the land, donated $10,000 to rebuild the grandstand and fix up the clubhouses. Labatt at that point deeded the land to the city of London. Professional baseball has graced the park over the years. The two most popular versions came in 1990 and 1999. In 1990, the Detroit Tigers relocated their AA team to Labatt Park. Again, the ballpark underwent a renovation with major upgrades to lights, clubhouse, dugouts, concession, 
and it marked the first time an electronic scoreboard was installed at the ballpark. During the AA Tigers time at Labatt Park, the park's head groundskeeper, Mike Regan, won the 1990 Bean Clay Award for Best Natural Grass Field in North America. The Tigers won the Eastern League Championship in 1990. The team relocated to Trenton, New Jersey in 1993 as the owners cited declining attendance as the reason. In 1999, the park would become home to the London Werewolves. The team played in the American-based Frontier League. The Werewolves would win the Frontier League Championship at Labatt Park in 1999. The following season, during the home opener, Ontario-born Brett Gray would make history. Gray struck out 25 batters in a single game. The park over the years has been used for more than just a baseball diamond. At one point or another, the park has hosted bicycle racing, soccer games, football, track and field, wrestling, professional wrestling, boxing, political rallies, show jumping, the RCMP musical ride, and was famously the venue for a 21-gun salute to Queen Elizabeth II during her visit in June of 1997. The ballpark has seen its fair share of famous baseball players pass through. Four players of note are legendary pitcher Satchel Paige, who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Londoner George Gibson, who played in the major leagues for 14 years, 12 with the Pirates and two with the New York Giants. George would win the World Series in 1909 as his Pirates beat Ty Cobb's Detroit Tigers. Gibson would go on to manage the Pirates and the Chicago Cubs. Gibson was elected into the Canadian Hall of Fame and was inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame in 1987. Gibson was elected into the London Sports Hall of Fame in its first class in 2001. Frank Coleman is another baseball player who played in London. Coleman is also credited with founding London's minor baseball system. Coleman founded the Eager Beaver Baseball Association in 1955. Coleman played in the major leagues for the Pittsburgh Pirates from 1942 to 1946, and then played for the New York Yankees from 1946 to 1947. While with the Yankees, Coleman's roommate was Baseball Hall of Famer Yogi Berra. Coleman entered the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame in the class of 1999 and was inducted into the London Sports Hall of Fame in 2005. Last, but certainly not least, is Chatham-born pitching legend Fergie Jenkins. Jenkins was the first Canadian elected into Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame in 1991. Jenkins was the first Canadian to win the NL Cy Young Award, which is given to the best pitcher at each of the two leagues. In 1987, Jenkins was inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Jenkins was made a member of the Order of Canada in 1979. For more information or tours of historic Labatt Park, you can visit labattparktours.ca. Since 2019, the Strathroy Model Railroad engineers have operated the Sleepy Hollow Railroad, which is a miniature railway owned by the municipality of Strathroy Caradoc. We're in the fairground uh, park in Strathroy. We're part of the Strathroy Model Railroad Engineers. We took over the Sleepy Hollow Railroad that's owned by the municipality of Strathroy Caradoc. Uh, we, I took it over about four years now, I think it is. We did a complete rebuild of the track, new ballast, new track, new rails, the whole nine yards. And every summer we just run the train for the kids and then we do special events like uh, Halloween, Christmas. We do a railway safety week in September. And it's just a one-eighth scale model train you can ride on and enjoy. From zero to 99. We usually do two laps around. It's not a big track. It's only about just shy of a thousand feet. Uh, so just a couple loops around uh, and then you can hop off. All rides are by donation. That's how you, that's how everything is done here. All the donations stay with the railroad and help us maintain the, uh, the track and everything. On the tail end of my train here, we got just a freight car train. They're just, for show, they're just filler cars. Obviously you got the caboose on the tail end. Where you would ride on the train is up behind the engine, is the yellow, green, and blue car. That's where you sit, it's like you ride like a bicycle, and you just go around the train. I walked into town hall and asked if they were doing anything with the train. They said no, 
I'm, uh, I work for CN. I'm a locomotive engineer. I'm in the trains myself. So I, uh, I told him, I was like, hey, I mean, if you're not doing anything with it, I'll take a look, see if I can get it working for you. And basically since then, they kind of let me run the train and take care of the, uh, the, the right away and everything. And we're a volunteer. And we're, we have a limited base volunteer. I think I got maybe five guys to help me. So we will try to do weekends, but we do our we post our days on our Facebook page. They yeah, just uh, interest in helping make children smile, and uh, I would say the interest in trains is always nice. But uh, as for volunteering, you can just check us out on Facebook. Let's drop three model railroad engineers on our Facebook page, and you can message us there for volunteers. We are obviously in need of volunteers. Hi, welcome to Norwich Museum. I'm the curator, Matthew Lloyd. We are north of downtown in Norwich, uh, up Highway 59 towards Quaker Street, where the original Norwich settlement was. When you get here, you'll see our yellow Centaur tractor that marks the way into our parking lot. And the main building there is the 1889 Quaker Meeting House. that was donated to the Historical Society to form the museum in 1971. This is uh, Peace Lossing's house. It was the first house that was built in Norwich in 1810 or 1811 when the, uh, the settlers first arrived in town. They cleared a plot of land and this was the first house they built. It was in use until the 1970s when it was moved to the museum uh, and restored to its original look. This is uh, Salt Box House, the roof is longer at the back than at the front because there are two stories at the front and only one at the back. Norwich Museum has five outbuildings, the two barns, the Lossing House, the old blacksmiths and the church. And uh, yeah, they contain different displays about uh, life in Norwich throughout its 200 year history. We call this the Dairy Barn. It focuses on the dairy heritage of Norwich and Oxford County as a whole. Uh, several butter churns and other butter making equipment here, and then milking equipment and various ways of uh, separating out the milk and cream over here. Norwich was the location of the first cheese factory in Canada, founded in 1864 by Harvey Farrington. And this is some of the cheese making equipment from various cheese factories around town. Cheese press. <laughs> but it's not just about dairy. There's all sorts of agriculture around here. And here is more of the hay lifting equipment, the various kinds of threshing machines. Uh, corn huskers and various other agricultural equipment. This is the implements barn, which has further agricultural implements as well as various other things from around town and around the county. So down here we have an early rural mail cart. Uh, George Wilcox, who was a Norwich resident, fought for the first rural mail in Canada. Uh, eventually it did come to Norwich and this was one of the original rail carts that was given a mail cart that was given a uh, cover. Back here, various hay binders that look very complicated and threshing machines. Back here, we have what I like to call the original washer dryers because you have both the washing aspect at the bottom and the mangles at the top, the ringers at the top that would uh, dry your clothes out. When you come inside, you'll find our exhibits on Norwich Settlement and downtown Norwich. Here is the drugstore uh, and also prehistoric Norwich. Some fossils, our mastodon exhibit and various uh, pre-settlement settlers. This is the United Church from the Norwich Gore. It was moved to the museum in 2011 when the church closed down. The Gore Church is available as a wedding venue and uh, the Quaker Meeting House as a reception venue for afterwards. And uh, yeah, it can be variously decorated and rearranged a little to suit your <laughs> interests. 
if you like. We're funded largely by grants from various government organizations. We're not a, a government-owned museum, but we do get a lot of funding from the township, the province, and the federal government. We are also, a lot of our funds come from private donations from individuals and businesses. In the summer, the museum is open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 10 till 4. In the fall, winter, and spring, it's Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 10 till 4. There's no admission fee. You can come in and donate what you think you would like to. We look forward to seeing you at Norwich Museum. We have lots for you to see here, and happy Canada Day. Vermilion Bay, Ontario, is home to the hitchhiking Bigfoot. Let's learn the history and story behind one of Canada's strangest roadside attractions. The legend of the Bigfoot. A myth? Or could this walking ape-like creature really exist? And could the small village of Vermilion Bay in northwestern Ontario be the key to finally unlocking its secret whereabouts? Well, mystery solved. Turns out Bigfoot has been hiding in plain sight all along. And if you've ever traveled across Canada, chances are you've probably passed it. My grandfather wanted it. He was kind of known for collecting odd things. So they brought it here and erected it with a couple of cranes and kind of became the, the logo for their business. Brought in as a marketing gimmick in the early 80s, this 20-foot, 3,000-pound Bigfoot stands just off the Trans-Canada Highway and is most well known for his signature thumbs up. I couldn't tell you why the guy that built it decided to uh, make him hitchhiking. Uh, in hindsight, it worked well because that's how he holds things, right? Doing everything in his power to hitch a ride, Bigfoot has even been known to dress up from time to time. My grandma made the costumes for him. That was kind of her thing. She, she really enjoyed sewing and crafting, and so whatever somebody came up with, she would try and create. We had the Canadian flag, the American flag, Kin Carnival costumes, Bermuda shorts. He had his Halloween costume. Uh, he always cast political votes, and he was obviously a conservative supporter, if you couldn't guess. A lot of neat things went on with Bigfoot over the years. We got a phone call from the Dryden police. They had arrested somebody and said that uh, he was claiming he had, he had stolen Bigfoot's arm. We all kind of stopped and thought like, man, like that's, that's gonna be a 500 pound arm. But the police were insistent he, had, he claimed he had it. Uh, they asked, we drove to town and look at it. So we, we did and you know, sure enough, Bigfoot's arm was still right where it was the last time we saw it. I'd be mighty impressed for somebody to cut through the concrete and rebar to steal his arm. The story goes is that the gentleman made Max the Moose and then continued here to build Bigfoot and then continued out west to build the concrete uh, dinosaurs in Drumheller, Alberta. But again, that's just a rumor. I don't know if there's any truth to that or not. In the town of Tilsonburg, in this year, 2022, we are actually celebrating our 150th anniversary of incorporation which just means when the province of Ontario actually granted legal status to create the town of Tilsonburg. Before this, we were a police village in Durham Township in the county of Oxford. And what that means is that it was Durham Township Council who decided things for the citizens of Tilsonburg. There had been people living here, actually, since George Tilson founded the community in 1825. So a little confusing thing, in 2022 we're celebrating 150 years of incorporation, but in 2025 we have another huge anniversary to come, which is 200 years since George Tilson built his first log cabin. You may wonder why it took to 1872 when people have been here since 1825 to get incorporated as a town. Well, historically, in order to be a town or a village incorporated or even a city, it was all based on population. And so in 1872 or prior, Tilsonburg didn't have a huge population. In fact, we had a really slow growth. Why did Tilsonburg grow slowly compared to the rest of Oxford County? Ingersoll was a town by the 1860s. Well, it all has to do with the railroad. 
The railroad came through Oxford County to the north of us, through Woodstock and Ingersoll, in 1853. But it didn't come south, down into what was Tilsonburg. So a group of citizens, led of course by the son of the founder, E.D. Tilson, the builder of Annandale House, and owner of over 12 businesses and factories in the community, employer to about a third of the working population, he led the charge that, you know what, we needed to get the railway into the community. If Tilsonburg was going to grow and prosper, the railway had to come. So, get the railway to come, you're going to grow. How do you get the railway to come? Well, you need to maybe offer it something. You need to offer perhaps a tax rebate or maybe not even a tax exemption. When you are governed by a township council, is Deerham Township Council going to offer you know, not to collect taxes from the railway? And if they go down into Tilsonburg, mm, maybe not. But if a Tilsonburg town council with its own mayor, its own councillors, they had the power to pass a bylaw and offer that tax exemption. So, makes sense become an incorporated town, you can get the railway. You've got leverage to get the railway to come. And that is exactly what happened. So 2022 is an exciting year for the whole town because we are you know, celebrating our incorporation as this town entity. Next year, however, we have another anniversary to celebrate and that's actually the 50th anniversary of the Community Museum. Uh, Annandale National Historic Site is designated, the house is designated for being an incredible home for its interior decoration. But it's also what the museum feels is our largest artifact. In fact, the museum next year in 2023 is going to be 50 years old. So we're celebrating a huge anniversary. The Tilsonburg Museum has always been a municipally owned and operated entity uh, with the cooperation of a lot of town uh, volunteers to help them run it. And the museum grew and changed. We are originally in the old dance hall on Lake Lisger, the Evergreens, which has also been the community hall. Uh, it was the first Lions Community Center before they built the big Tilsonburg Community Center. And the Tilsonburg Community Center is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary this November. So the community center moved out into its new home and the museum got the old building and was there until we moved out of it in 1989 to move over here to Annandale House. So we are the home of the Community Museum and we're planning lots of fun things throughout the whole year and of course a big birthday party in June. That brings an end to this episode of Rogers TV's Canada Showcase. Be sure to catch the other episodes in this series for more stories from across the country. I'm Mike Vecchio, thanks for watching. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Tyler Fines, host of Off the Puck Hockey on Rogers Channel 20. We interview some of the biggest names in hockey and sports. Check us out, Rogers Channel 20, Off the Puck Hockey. Let's go. As the fighting continues in Ukraine, thousands of people are fleeing for their lives, forced to leave everything behind. You can help them. Your donation to the Humanitarian Coalition will provide food, water, 